Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this seminar on Belarus, where we aim to take stock of the political situation in the country nine months after uh, the uh, 2020 presidential elections threw the country into an unprecedented political crisis. My name is Helge Blokkisru, and I'm a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and it's my pleasure to moderate this afternoon's uh, session. In the seminar, uh, we will examine uh, the evolving political crisis in Belarus. How did the opposition movement succeed in overcoming the widespread political disengagement or political apathy that has characterized the Belarusian uh, society in, in, in recent years? What has changed? Uh, and how do Belarusians themselves uh, view these changes? And what will be the next steps uh, from the side of the regime, as well as um, the opposition. These are some of the questions that we would like to discuss uh, with our panelists and with you over the next uh, one and a half uh, hour. And to help us better understand the current dynamics, uh, we offer you a stellar uh, lineup of, of panelists this afternoon. We have uh, Sophie Bedford from the Institute for Russian and Eurasian Studies at uh, Uppsala University. We have Nadia Douglas from the Center for East European and International Studies, uh, or ZOIS, in Berlin. We have uh, Maria Rojava from the University of Oslo. And last but not least, Rihor Astapenia from the Russia and Eurasia program at uh, Chatham House uh, in the UK. And we, will, we have decided to organize this as uh, a roundtable discussion followed by uh, a Q&A session. And I'd like to inform you that this uh, event is being recorded and that we will uh, publish um, uh, the recording uh, in uh, Nupi's uh, YouTube channel after the event. And by now, you, you know the drill. You can ask questions in the chat. Uh, please don't wait until the very last moment. Uh, I will try to include questions uh, if they're relevant uh, throughout the discussion and uh, and then we'll also have time for a more regular Q&A towards the end of, uh, of the event. I have invited uh, the panelists to, to give uh, brief introductions to, to the main themes uh, of today's seminar the background for the mobilization, the post-election uh, protest uh, uh, and the organization of the opposition, uh, national identity and identification, uh, and the, also the, the foreign uh, policy dimension with the role of Russia and the EU. And after that, we'll move to a more uh, general discussion of the current situation and the way ahead uh, before we turn to the, to the, to the Q&A. But we'll, we'll start with the background for the mobilization, uh, and I'll turn to, to, to Sophie first. Up until last year, uh, Belarus seemed to be characterized by widespread political disengagement, uh, political apathy in the population at large. There was, of course, a political opposition, but this seemed to have very limited appeal beyond the core electorate, uh, the core constituency. And last year, this suddenly all changed. And we've seen uh, photos, all of us, from Minsk and from other cities, with thousands and thousands of people pouring into the streets to protest. And you have published uh, an article on the Belarusian, uh, Belarusian elections, so we we'll discussed for him. And for those of you who read Swedish or Scandinavian languages, uh, you will find a link to Sophie's uh, excellent article uh, in the chat. Uh, but could you please take us uh, through uh, the background? What, what were the main reasons here behind the mass mobilization uh, against the regime? Sophie. Thank you. Uh, that's, of course, uh, an excellent question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have like a simple answer to this question. I don't think we can say that there's one or two specific reasons. Uh, but maybe we'll talk instead. I will talk instead about some 
you know, major developments that took place over some time in the Belarusian society and kind of paved the way for this, what finally became this explosive mobilization that we saw last year. Uh, and I think I should start by saying that uh, Belarus has, until very recently, Belarus was described by by analysts or in the literature as a very kind of unique authoritarian state. Uh, and why? Because people actually seem to like their their leadership, or at least they were okay with the way uh, that the the regime, with the kind of system that this re regime represented. So the first kind of important development was that this was changing, seemingly. Uh, that for some time Lukashenko and his system has been starting to lose legitimacy among the population. And why did this happen? Well, it's um, the way the system was kind of set up. Uh, it was it was set up to guarantee the citizens uh, sort of minimum basic level of social welfare, welfare and kind of stability. Uh, and in return for this, they were expected not to question the lack of democratic uh, structures or you know the democratic standards of society. Um, but because the Belarusian economy has been suffering for a long time, there's been an economic decline, there was this increasing perception among the population that maybe the state could actually couldn't provide this welfare that it, that it was expected to, that they couldn't trust that the state took care of them. Uh, so why should they keep protecting the system? But of course, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as people didn't get paid and that's why they went out on the street. Instead, there seemed to have been like a, a growing awareness, especially among the young population, that uh, Belarus needed to be modernized or they, they needed to be like economic and political reforms that took Belarus up to a more kind of more modern standard of, uh, of the system. Uh, and these citizens seem to think that Lukashenko and his ruling elite were kind of blocking this. They were standing away of these necessary reforms. And I think this was very, it was kind of very visible during the election campaign and also in the post-election protest, this lack of legitimacy for Lukashenko and his system. And we can see it, we could see that the protesters were calling Lukashenko a cockroach, they were calling him a psycho, and we also saw a lot of creative ways people were expressing that they were very unhappy with the way uh, Lukashenko kind of approached gender relation, the way he treated women, and so on. So that was kind of one thing. And then I would say that another development that I think is also very important, uh, and that maybe we don't talk as much about was uh, there was actually an increasing uh, number of grassroots activities happening in Belarus like for the past five years and this took place maybe in the cultural or in the environmental sector uh, and they were more or less kind of independent I guess uh, but it was interesting that so many people in the population actually gladly engaged in this they kind of took part in this event so these initiatives and there was also uh, a growing number of protests on the grassroots level, kind of against specific, often very local initiatives. Um, so I think this is important and, and I think it's important because sometimes or very often we were told or we had the impression that because the Belarusians were, as Helge mentioned, they were not involved in politics, they were kind of apolitical, uh, we think that they were passive, but they actually they were not. Uh, so and this kind of it shows that this was not the case. So yeah, th these were two th these kind of two processes they've been going on for some time, uh, but it wasn't until last year that we, they translated into this uh, demobilization and politicization. And, and why did it happen now? Yeah, um, because there's two. Can, yeah, sorry, yes, sure. because you, you you say that this has then been some time in the coming the, the social contract. Uh, breaking down, and at the same time, this grassroots uh, mobilization gradually maybe building a potential for momentum. But w what was the catalyst here? There was two such catalysts, I would say, and I think it's fairly well kind of accepted now among the observers that uh, the first one was the Corona crisis, Corona pandemic, and the second one was the actual presidential election. Uh, and the coronavirus uh, pandemic, well, I think everybody knows by now that the, sorry, I think it's my, my thing is uh, 
making a lot of noise. Uh, anyway, uh, everybody knows that the Belarusian authorities and Lukashenko in particular didn't take the coronavirus seriously. So, so people felt like they had to protect themselves. They had to take the matters into their own hands. Uh, and they started a number of citizen initiatives. Uh, and they collecting money and they were collecting material to kind of pr help the healthcare workers in this. And I think maybe it's possible that this kind of activism came from these grassroots uh, actors that I mentioned before. Uh, but in, in any case, it, it was clearly uh, a big mistake by Lukashenko to, to end this kind of feeling of that people were uh, resenting the system, that they were dissatisfied with the political leadership and what they were doing, and they were in a mobilization mood. Then he announced the election, and that became devastating for him. Uh, and if I may interrupt there, so okay. yeah, uh, yeah. in your article you discuss uh, electoral authoritarianism and, and the politics of uncertainty. Uh, and how is it that elections, even in a tight, highly controlled context such as Belarus, uh, may expose the regime to, to unwanted uncertainty, uh, even an electoral revolution? Uh... Well, I think, I mean, like the, the COVID crisis, for example, it's one of these things that they did not expect. Mm -hmm. uh, so they thought that they could go on. They they try to do it in the same way as, as they always do. Uh, and also they announced the election early, for example, uh, and they thought that this would prevent the, the uh, traditional political opposition from managing to select a united candidate. And it was true, it did because the, the the traditional opposition could not have the primaries that they had had planned to do so that seemed to in that way it seemed like this this strategy was uh, working the way it should but they didn't expect this mobilization they they somehow didn't understand that people that this uh, that his legitimacy was already faltering among the population and that this kind of became the the thing that uh, that broke the the straw that broke the camel's back in a way the COVID crisis uh, people people they knew that the social contract didn't work but this was the obvious that this now they gave them the evidence that they really don't care about the population so I think this is the kind of things that there are always these unexpected moments and if they occur then this can kind of blow the thing up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think there's another, it's not only the the, the mood that people were in a mobilization mood, but there was also the fact that this time there were these candidates. Uh, there was Tikhanovsky, there was Babarika and Sepkala, and later Tikhanovsky. And, and they became very popular, popular in a completely different way than the usual traditional political opposition, oppositional actors are. Uh, so they became popular because they were not associated with like the old, the old ways, the old traditional opposition. Because there's another important, very important part of the puzzle why these elections could go on for year after year after year. Because uh, even though people maybe not loved having an authoritarian president in Lukashenko, they also didn't see that there was an alternative. Uh, because the the oppositional actors were seen as kind of yeah marginalized, not influential, actually not relevant at all. This, this they were seen as people are going around fighting wind, windmills and trying to win their own battles kind of unnecessarily. Uh, so this was the like another important the fact that these candidates appeared in this election in this particular time in place that uh, that gave, gave people hope and it inspired them to. Uh, to kind of to kind of vote, and I don't know if you want to come in again, but uh, yeah. Yes, I I would like to come in and 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 ask, and this might also go to 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 the rest of the panelists uh, as well, um, because the candidates, um, uh, Barbarica and, and Sapkawa, they are a different kind of candidates, as you said, Sophie. They they, they were more establishment candidates. Uh, while, uh, as far as I understand, previously we have seen more uh, uh, marginalized uh, um, politicians as leaders of, of the opposition. So, so uh, again, back to the question of why now, why did we this time around see something that might resemble a, a slight splintering of, of the establishment with with uh, people 
in, in prominent positions, uh, uh, taking up the, the, the mantle of, of the opposition. Uh, Sophie or, or others, if you want to, to chip in on that. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have a 100% good answer, I think, to that question. So somebody else has a thought, you go first. Do we have any good answers here among the rest of you? Maria. Well, I think it's kind of builds on what Sophie was saying about the grassroots or kind of organization logics that actually help to bring them. So the problem with the position as well, that they were not able to kind of break the, the existing institutional structure of competition between our basically the government and the position in the traditional sense. So and in this moment, it was this unexpected moment of their announcement and building on what uh, was available at that moment. And we saw with COVID as well that uh, the society was able to capitalize on existing uh, social networks that actually persisted for a really long time. We have seen how actually those social networks with both uh, cultural project and social project managed to raise money, which was very important aspect of this. So you did as a traditional position mostly relied on foreign funding. This candidate managed to fundraise based on our domestic audience. So this was a significant change with the structure. So this fundraising element uh, was also a key. So it, uh, and as well, they reached out using different uh, different tools. So they have absolutely different campaign strategy. So they use social media, they used a different profile targeting cross cultural groups. So creating broader coalitions in society. And this is why it broke a different pattern from a traditional position. So in this way, they just their strategy for campaigning was uh, was uh, kind of changing the entire elect electoral patterns uh, that existed before. And this is why I think uh, um, it resonated in society. So new faces and new ways and new messages. Yeah, it's also kind of, I think the most important part was building, you know, cross coalitions. So we don't talk very much about, uh, you know, electoral politics, but in electoral politics, it's very important to target the audience that were not mobilized before. Mm -hmm. And they managed to do that. And they managed to do that based on our as well kind of kind of symbolic authorities those some candidates for example had for example Babarika he had as well cultural capital on which he could build because he invested a lot in cultural projects uh, in Belarus and as well like a uh, Russian speaking audience and many other kind of aspects so they are able to kind of capitalize on this kind of cross cultural uh, and cross group building basically. Enrico, please. Yeah thanks a lot well actually I think that all of these candidates, they have their own personal reasons to join the campaign. For example, Valery Tsipkala, he was a very successful official. He actually built this high tech park, which was like one of the brands of the country. And he was very angry about the fact that he was he was fired. And Viktor Babarika has his own reasons. And But if we speak and about maybe structural issues, I think the most important one is was that actually there is a belief among Belarus establishment that Lukashenko is no longer able to deliver development to the country. So this, it's a strongly strong belief and many people think so. And that is why some officials thought or ex officials or bankers thought that actually, well, maybe it's time. Yes, and, and Nadia, please. Yeah, maybe uh, just to add uh, uh, just one comment. I think also um, those messages were very important. Uh, those uh, alternative candidates, they picked up uh, topics in their campaigns that really uh, touched or moved the people. There were topics they were occupied with at the moment. Uh, large parts of the population were thinking about their social economic problems, um, things that the, the regime never really addressed and also the COVID uh, crisis, as it has been mentioned. And then in contrast to that, Lukashenko's absent program really, um, and all his hollow phrases really appeared so uh, empty and didn't convince at all anymore at this point. Mm -hmm. And if you then stick with you, Nadia, and, and, and move towards uh, uh, the, the, um, 
uh, post-election protests and, and, and what happened after the elections. Zoys have conducted some interesting surveys on protest participation and, and public attitudes. Could you, could you share some of your findings? Who are the, who were taking part? What did they want? Yes, um, a first remark, um, I think we are, what we're witnessing here now is not only a political crisis, but also a societal crisis. So now we have a stalemate situation between the authorities uh, that uh, sort of try to regain uh, the upper hand and they are, let's say, fairly successful in that. And then on the other hand, we have society that um, remains partly divided, unsettled and also unsure how things could uh, evolve further. And uh, recently, I saw also um, other surveys, and it, it, it appears that the belief in the in the in the demo democracy movement and the uh, exiled opposition and the team of Tsikhanouskaya seems to be dropping again uh, in the, those approval rates, um, and also in other um, exiled opposition bodies. So, state society uh, relations have always been particular in Belarus. Um, so there was um, from the 90s onwards a relatively uh, low degree of social and also interpersonal trust. It's something that we also examined in our survey. Um, and um, this also obviously affected the readiness uh, to protest in society. Um, and I would even say that the post-electoral period um, with regard to the public attitudes um, uh, was uh, rather unusual, like uh, or an, an outlier. The period before and the period we have now, uh, maybe is the it's the more usual state. Um, so our um, our choice survey um, that in, indicated also a generational rift. Um, and uh, maybe just uh, for, as a background, the, the survey uh, was funded by the Federal Foreign Office uh, and it was conducted among uh, 2000 uh, Belarusians uh, aged 16, between 16 and 64. Um, and I just want to highlight uh, a few elements um, that illustrate quite well the, the, the changing uh, political and social mood that nevertheless we can con con um, consider that there is a changing mood in society. Um, what first of all was very interesting is to see the uh, the participation in protests. We asked about uh, respondents directly whether they participated or not in in in, in post electoral protests, and 14% uh, indicated that they did. Um, at first glance, that doesn't appear to be much, but uh, if we um, uh, reflect that on our quota sample, that means 700,000 out of five million people did attend the protests. And from protest research, we know that this is an incredibly high uh, percentage, um, even in, in more democratic, more protest uh, prone societies, we don't reach these levels. So secondly, um, people have become more politicized. That is quite obvious. Over 50 percent of the respondents stated that um, they became more interested in politics uh, during the last six months. And also they have developed great expectations towards economic and political change. So people want to have a voice in the political process. They want to put the Belarus, the country to be uh, independent and to remain independent. Um, and uh, of course, also uh, economic expectations such as um, increase of uh, living standards, um, secure jobs, um, tackling the problem of, of, of unemployment are uh, really um, big demands. And what was very interesting for me personally also was we asked at the very end that people could um, sort of um, give a judgment or uh, give their personal opinion about the survey itself. And so many people filled out this, this box and stated that they were so glad to have been to have taken part in this survey and they even expected change coming out of these independent surveys. So that was kind of yeah, really interesting to see and also touching to see all these positive comments. And thirdly, um, the trust in political institutions remains uh, weak. Um, uh, distrust, especially in the president and the executive and the security structures, uh, exceeds 50%, except for two um, bodies, that is the Coordination Council and uh, institution, uh, the, the Orthodox Church. So they are the only ones uh, that have uh, not, uh, that have uh, less high uh, distrust and more, uh, where, where, let's say, where trust prevails over distrust. 
Um, then uh, I mentioned interpersonal trust. Um, the majority, um, when we ask uh, interpersonal trust or social trust, means uh, the question is uh, how much uh, do you trust the person you meet for the first time? And when we ask uh, whether this has changed uh, during the last six months, the majority remained uh, the same. They, 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 it stagnated. So even uh, more people, more respondents said that uh, their trust decreased than it increased. With one exception, uh, the, those people that we put in the category of regime critics, um, so people that um, attended protests that were more politicized, uh, for example, that have greater affinity to the Belarusian language, those people actually uh, saw that uh, uh, stated that their interpersonal trust had has increased, which is not so surprising because um, making it, uh, feeling this wave of solidarity, uh, meeting other people, like-minded people on the streets, made these people more confident in their fellow citizens. And uh, last but not least, um, uh, violence by security structures is the main issue of fear and concern. So fear played and still plays an important role. 40% of the re respondents were initially very afraid to participate in protests. And 25% um, said they were more afraid the, larger, uh, the longer they took part in the protests or they even stopped for the reason uh, of, of fear uh, to participate. That's what we see today. People are very insecure and insecure because it has become very unsafe to take part in, 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 in street activities or other, other any kind of protest. Um, so over 70 percent, which is also very overwhelming, said that they were very and or somewhat concerned about the activities of the security structures. But this is not a new phenomenon because 70% uh, uh, when asked uh, whether the security forces were used in the past to suppress opposition or dissent, 70% uh, stated that often, sometimes or always, these security forces were used by the, by the system, by the political uh, regime to suppress dissent. And I leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. And a, a follow-up question, uh, Nadia. Uh, so you, you said that um, based on your survey and, and you get 14% that uh, responded that had taken part. Uh, it is, an, as you point out, an impressive number. And we saw that unlike in many other similar contexts, uh, protests were not limited to the capital. It uh, you, you saw it in, 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 in regional uh, centers and smaller towns as well. But, but um, a follow up question on who the protesters uh, where or, or are. Uh, many of us took part in uh, the ASN convention last week and, and there they referred, uh, uh, one of the presenters referred to another survey that said that 70% 70, 70 of the participants were middle class. Uh, so it was a different segment uh, or, or, or a greater uh, share of middle class representations uh, than in Ukraine. Uh, than in uh, the protests that have taken place in, in Russia. Do, do you have data on this, uh, on who they are, who, who took part, and uh, and if this was an embracing all society, or if it was this overrepresentation that was indicated here of, of the middle class? Um, first of all, um, of course, uh, protests took part uh, nationwide, yeah? But uh, still, we have a um, larger percentage of um, people, respondents that uh, were in Minsk Oblast. And then uh, the average uh, protester uh, uh, is male, middle age, um, and um, has a um, relatively, yeah, or let's say uh, um, even under average household income, but is uh, over average um, educated. Uh, so the, the 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 large share of of the participants were um, working in private business uh, or um, at least not in the in the uh, in state institutions that were uh, uh, linked in any way with the with the with the government or the um, the authorities. Um, and um, besides that, interesting was also that um, there was a greater share of uh, younger and older generations. So let's say also who carried these protests. Um, uh, we found out it was more private citizens. 
uh, less the organized civil society, because when we ask about um, membership of uh, uh, civil society organizations, associations, that was fairly low. Um, and also um, people, it's also not the churches or th that uh, carried the protest because um, the large majority of respondents who participated in protests were uh, self-described as non-religious. And also the trade unions were not the major driving force. A large majority states that they are part of trade unions but it's not the trade unions that uh, politicize them in, in, in a way. And then the, the, we have to say also the, the, uh, partic uh, the, the, the share of those that uh, at the time were members of the independent trade unions was negligible um, below 3% and the majority was part of the, the federal uh, state uh, um, trade unions. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw this massive turnout uh, for, for weeks and, and, and months and then in the face of, of, of the harsh repression from the regime, it, it eventually died out and, and I, 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 Svetlana Tikhonovska said that they've lost the streets, but uh, there have been calls for um, uh, remobilizing people, getting people back into the streets on, in March again uh yesterday um what 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 are the prospects and this goes to, to to all of you who, who whoever wants to chip in uh what is uh the prospects of of regaining uh the momentum for uh the opposition at at this stage are the streets lost uh or is it possible to again uh, get people to, to turn out uh, in, in the numbers that we saw uh, last fall? And, and also, is that something that the opposition wants at this stage when they know about the, the potential consequences? Uh, I will just answer shortly to this because I think it's rather the the local analysts uh, and uh, from from the outside is very difficult to judge uh, what is the problem of keeping the momentum and uh, from what I have uh, read and seen or observed or le last week I, I um, uh, listened to a presentation of uh, Artyom Schreitman and I really highly respect his judgments, his, his uh, political judgment and uh, he, he um, underlined that um, uh, they, they are just, they still haven't found new forms of safe, safe expression. So that is the biggest problem. The price for the participation in those uh, protest activities, uh, no matter whether they call for different dates, uh, 25th of March or now, the, uh, or the Chernobyl um, uh, annual commemoration, or the now the, the 9th of May, uh, it doesn't matter as long as the the price is too high for 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 uh, the average citizen to uh, to actually express their opinion um, and 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 to, or even take to the street so i would say that um, at the present moment it just seems like as if a um, window of opportunity has been slightly closing down and um, then artyom also mentioned the absence of emotional triggers and I think that is very important. I could imagine that also if in case this uh, whole unification discourse becomes a bit materializes more and becomes really up on the agenda again, yeah, that there's an actual threat of Belarus uh, unifying uh, with Russia, then I think this would take people uh, uh, or this would, would would be cause for uh, for 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 uh, new outrage, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then last but not least, uh, we the, the biggest problem for 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 the uh, movement is that uh, the most active people are either jailed at the moment or they are in exile. Mm -hmm. So that would be my take. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Yeah, well, I can add just two things. Uh, I think that actually the city is lost for some time, at least for some time, maybe 
for a long time, I don't know. But actually many people are really afraid and they are scared by tortures, by being imprisoned, etc. So it's very difficult to organize anything right now in the country. Uh, at the same time, of course, Belarus and democratic movement would like to have more protests on the streets uh, because it gives them and gives the whole democratic movement more more sense and uh, and actually without protests Belarusian politics doesn't exist for the west or for Russia etc so if you don't have any protests so people outside the country think that it's pretty okay, everything's pretty okay with your country exactly uh, and 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 uh, I heard a presentation by Svetlana Tikhanovskaya when it, uh, she talked about this, these images that uh, of the people in the streets that mobilize. But this is not what is at stake. It's the it's the the values behind it, not 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 the numbers in the streets. But it is of course very difficult to catch the attention of uh, of media and, and the public in the, in the West with. The values, the appeal to the values, and, and and not the persuasion of of the powerful images. But what can the opposition do now? Uh, when, as was pointed out here, members are jailed or in exile, w would they be? Is it able to consolidate? And and also, where does the opposition find itself? Uh, this new opposition that we were talking about in between the old opposition uh, from previous elections and also more, uh, say, reform oriented elements within the regime. Is it, are they reaching out or are they uh, drawing the borders. Uh, what what is the position of of the opposition right now? And that goes to everyone. So whoever wants to respond first. No one. Uh, Nadia, and then Maria. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult uh, to tell them what to do. I mean, I think. Uh, Tikhanuskaya and her team, they, they, they try to really literally use all avenues uh, possible to raise awareness, uh, to convince uh, uh, Western states and decision makers to, uh, yeah, to, to uh, increase the pressure on, on the Belarusian authorities. But what I um, observed was uh, slowly there is uh, a sense of unity lacking um, or um, I have the feeling that um, there are too many oppositional bodies. So the maybe the average citizen in Belarus has lost the overview who is responsible for, for what and what they actually do in, in, in Vilnius uh, and in exile. And, um, there now new parties have been uh, uh, created, uh, but I don't know if this is so constructive or beneficial if there are lots of different uh, oppositional forces and parties and if it hadn't been better to create, create more of a sense of unity and uh, um, sort of uh, use the synergies uh, to um, uh, join forces. Yes, because uh, uh... Uh, multiplying the, the, the number of parties hardly uh, increases uh, the push of the, of the of the opposition in its its current form. But Maria, you wanted to come in. Um, I just think that it's a. Uh, uh we, ha we also have to understand the level of repression so it's not just you know uh, the repression toward uh, opposition of figures it's like repression at all levels of. Uh, are expressed in any kind of form of dissent. You know, we have uh, anecdotal, of course, uh, evidence, but, you know, people are arrested for wearing white and red socks. You know, people are arrested for displaying underwear in their balconies. So it's it's like the, the level of rep repression. So they are in this situation is so significant uh, that uh, how to gain this leverage, institutional leverage to change the system is is uh, is a complicated kind of task. Um, and this is why, for example, 
uh, people were why their position as well building those networks in exile so this kind of also still an important leverage if you as well lose the momentum from exile it's also you will lose completely everything so i think in this way we cannot advise them of course uh, i mean they are agents of their own kind of political agenda but i mean at the same time it's it's important for them to maintain valories in their foreign policy agenda and as well to provide uh limited but essential leverages uh, on on the regime but i also wanted to underline that people inside the country they also have certain agencies and what we can see from the surveys and uh, uh, both by chetham house and and soys that the the, the the changes are happening and this is uh, what as well as the regime is sensing that uh, this kind of uh, a pillar of of uh, legitimation, pillar of kind of this institutional stability is no longer there. And then if this pillar is not there, it kind of provokes them to make a lot of mistakes. And we have seen those mistakes happen you know, in the electoral campaign. And this is as well possibility for them to, to make those mistakes in the future. Maybe it's not this kind of imminent, but it's there is still this possibility to do. So yes, right now the protest is not as a form for, for uh, political engagement. But it's also for the regime to as well kind of build a certain kind of strategy. And right now we see that it's only responding and just, to, you know, putting on a screw on and further repressions, creating extremist laws or uh, further limiting med uh, independent media. So there is a lot of, you know, elements that are in play here. Absolutely. But if, if we stick with with you, Maria, and, and uh, change uh, the topic slightly again, uh, you have done a lot of interesting work on, on uh, identity and, and uh, identification and the protests. Well, in, in the beginning, I guess there were, were a mix of green and red and uh, 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 white and red. But, but uh, as they evolved, it seemed like uh, they were dressed in red and white, uh, the, the alternative national colors of Belarus and can you take us through how the mobilization that took place since last August has affected how the population relate and identify uh, because before uh, the, the traditional uh, opposition has frequently been uh, fairly narrowly defined uh, in when it comes to to to, to national identity, I, I assume. But but now it seemed like a, uh, a shift took place. But but could you could you tell us a little bit about what has happened when it comes to how people identify uh, as Belarusians? Um. I, would, I, would, I wanted to start with by pointing out that in kind of my perspective, I didn't see that identity was the main trigger for mobilization. So here we really don't see that identity was this kind of mobilization marker that brought people on the street. That was absolutely different dynamic. Here people mobilize in response to state led violence and state sanctioned violence that uh, happened in their uh, post election period. This motivated people to respond in uh, so this kind of grievances were completely redirected in a different dimension. People were really protesting in support of uh, civic, civic and uh, political kind of liberties and freedoms. Uh, and this is, was a kind of uh, element that united them in this moment. Uh, what we have seen as well is what we have seen and probably observed is a kind of the changes in the symbolic space and what people kind of noticed. But I also don't think that it was like significant because uh, um, white, red and white flag was traditionally perceived as a, as a signifier for opposition and for political opposition. So I think that kind of it got more relevance because opposition group grew with this. And of course we saw more signifiers of this uh, because people started to associate themselves as well with opposition and they wanted to signal others that it's a, you know, it's a safe space. It's a, it's, uh, they're part of this collective there as well signalizing with those there with uh, both with white uh, ribbons, with uh, uh, with a flag that they are part of this group. So it's mostly like to signify 
this uh, collective and protest mode in 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 this way. Uh, but what I want I wanted to as well to highlight in this kind of identity element as well is as well this kind of division of the narrative that happened in this moment. It's like complete. Uh, um, division uh, between these groups in how the narrative shifted because one started to symbolize and they used very kind of uh, um, simplified narratives. They started to refer again to stability, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the need to protect what they, what they built already. So they also used not very catchy and very kind of simplistic terms to identify their groupings that were mocked <laughs> horribly in a different way because it just was not the right term. And then the other groups that were, you know, uh, had a very futuristic vision of Belarus and then they helped as well to create those groupings. They wanted to orient toward, you know, uh, freedom, civic liberties. They wanted to build a, a future of Belarus. And as well, we can see that there is still a, this kind of demand for political changes and this political changes is uh, kind of uh, we can observe in surveys that are conducted. This uh, demand of political change remains despite even such a significant level of repressions and this is kind of uh, what I wanted to highlight but I then but in terms of identity it really kind of uh, it's the reaction of the government toward the those kind of signifiers of dis of dissent that provoked such a uh, stronger reaction an emotional reaction from the people they started more uh, stronger to identify with those symbols because of the government reaction toward them mm -hmm. and in recent year we have seen uh, what some have uh, referred to as a soft Belarus and Belarusification or Belarusianization uh, from the side of Lukashenko. Um, but but you say that identity is not uh, that relevant here so so this will not roll back this or this is not something that uh, the opposition has uh, through the protest now uh, captured. Uh, you think this more emphasis on the Belarus Belarusian identity will continue to be uh, a factor in, in Lukashenko's policy also in the years to come? Mm -hmm. I think here is just, you know, so many level of analysis that is hard to <laughs> to kind of put together. Of course, there is, you know, we, we want to look at the top level of analysis and then as well, I kind of immediately skip and go into the how people identify. <laughs> and I think this is like a big, a big of a problem. So in the level of the elites, uh, uh, what people kind of were saying is that uh, Lukashenko kind of adopted and basically co-opted some of the narratives that kind of existed within a position. So uh, in a way it allowed certain kind of uh, cultural elements to exist at the much more public level. So they definitely changed and made some rebranding uh, to make it much more appealing based on this kind of uh, on a cultural narratives that were shared by the Belarusians. Uh, but uh, right now and as well what if you uh, have seen yesterday um, well yesterday was 9th of may and uh, it also coincided with uh, uh, their uh, day of the state uh, flag and uh, and sta state emblem so they also organized additional speeches for this so they really wanted to build the narrative that you know this is the state that kind of connects to the war and the, so they, they do trying to very to build a very simplistic narrative for the people. But the problem is as well, if you skip to the bottom up kind of uh, to the level of the people, it's no longer kind of that simplistic for them because there are so many other alternative of how people actually relate to the state and how they engage with the state because there are so many kind of cultural uh, products uh, that exist. They also alternative ways of expressing uh, what, what it means to be Belarusian. Uh, so I think in this way kind of by building such a simplistic and very outdated narrative it does not it's no longer has uh, the same appeal and and I think there is this kind of moment of a deep division between what society is and what their current government of Belarus is. Well, uh, I then we do a jump again 
Thank you, Maria. Uh, and I will turn to, to Richard and to the question of uh, uh, the international dimension of, of, uh, of the conflict. Um, before the elections, um, the, the Lukashenko regime accused Russia of interfering. Uh, uh, there was a lot of publicity around this. Um, Russian mercenaries from the Wagner Group uh, being apprehended in, in, in Belarus and, and accused of plotting to sabotage the elections. And there also been strained relations between, uh, on a personal level, between uh, Putin and, and Lukashenko for, for a long time. Um, still in the end, Russia uh, backed the embattled Lukashenko. And, Richard, how do you see Kremlin's position uh, evolve here? Uh, was it at some stage uh, before or also after the election? Were they, were they ready in the Kremlin to, to give up on, on Lukashenko? Ready to, to support uh, one of the other establishment or more establishment candidates? And, and also, what, what are the long term aspirations? Maybe not the long term, the mid term rather, aspirations of of, uh, of the Kremlin uh, when it comes to the Lukashenko regime. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, the Kremlin thinks that although Lukashenko is uh, is not their best friend, but it's their best option to actually leave Belarus in the in the Russia sphere of influence. And uh, I think in general, we should know that we should understand that actually Russia's policy towards Belarus is mostly a function of Russia's policy towards the West. And unfortunately, Bel Belarus is just a country that is between Russia and the West. And until this crisis in relations between Russia and the West will not be finished, well, Belarus will be just, just uh, in the middle of this relationship. And, uh, and I think that actually Russia considered several options in August, but they decided that it doesn't make much sense for them to risk. That's why they decided to meet uh, the most conservative decision and to support Lukashenko. And if, if we look what happened over the last Nine, nine months, there was just like a week, maybe two, when Russia seriously was thinking what to do next. Uh, but then they decided to support Lukashenko, but to recognize him as a president, to provide him with some loans, to send Russian journalists to Belarus to uh, help him in the media sphere, to show also Belarusian democratic movement as uh, Western agents to, and of course, finally, the recent story by supporting Lukashenko's version of the so-called coup that was, uh, let's not organized by some people from the democratic movement. So I think that actually right now with Russia invested uh, in Lukashenko and they would like to be to get paid and uh, get paid back. And uh, Lukashenko is a very diff difficult person to actually to negotiate, but it seems very likely that, well, he will, he will provide something to Russia. We don't know what will happen. And of course, he promised a lot in, in September, later. We, we do not know what he promised, but it's likely that there was a talk about uh, integration roadmaps, that Belarus and Russia, uh, not Belarus, Lukashenko and Russia would like to sign uh, some uh, ideas about having an air base of Russia in Belarus, maybe something about uh, Lukashenko's transit of power that will allow more pro-Russian uh, politicians to participate in the running of the country. So I think that what's happening between Lukashenko and uh, Russia and you say that it's uh, it's not easy to negotiate 
with Lukashenko, and he has uh, been efficient in resisting uh, offers from Russia uh, before. But it is so weakened now because of what took place last year that he, he has to to give more than he, he wants to, you think? Well, if you speak about him, he strongly believes that he's a genius. So it's very difficult to change that. So he believes in that, so he will negotiate in his, his things on terms. But yes, he will give something. It's very definite that he is supposed to give something, maybe to sign like 25 integration roadmaps, maybe to provide more opportunities for Russian political structures to influence inside the country. But yes, something will happen, definitely. And, and there's been talks about creeping annexation. Uh, but is the if you should speculate here, uh, would it be uh, closer integration, as you pointed out uh, already, with military integration, uh, Russian bases, or would it be in the economic sphere, or would it be uh, reviving the union state and have closer political integration, or what? What directions do you think uh, the Kremlin's interest goes here? Uh, well, the Kremlin is mostly interested in military integration because it believes that the rest will follow. That if you integrate military, so the economic integration will follow. So that's why Lukashenko is trying to push forward this economic agenda to say, well, let's integrate a little bit more in the economic sphere, let's have the common tax code, etc. And then on the other hand, uh, oh, sorry, on the other side of uh, Belarus, we find the EU. Um, and Poland and Lithuania have been very vocal and active, but beyond that, the EU has been quite slow in, in, in responding. Uh, does the EU have some leverage? Can they play a more active role here, a constructive role uh, in resolving uh, the political crisis in, in Belarus? Yeah, I think that the EU or the West generally strongly believes that it cannot change anything in, in, inside the country. And I don't want to overcriticize the EU or any other Western states, because actually by the end of the day, without this Western influence in Belarus, Belarus would look, look like, like Turkmenistan. But if we look what happened over the last year, we should admit that actually the EU and the rest of the Western states, except like Lithuania, they were very slow in looking for any political solutions for this crisis. They, they were very slow in adopting sanctions. They were reluctant and they still are reluctant in uh, putting pressure on the third countries that recognize Lukashenko. And of course, they doesn't, they do not want to talk with Russia. Maybe they want, but maybe it seems that Russia doesn't want to talk with the West about Belarus. So that's why there are not so many options for the West left. It's like, what the, what the Western states can do is just like morally and uh, maybe somehow financially support the democratic movement, human rights defenders, civil society, media, etc. Uh, broadening this to, to the, the rest of the panel as well, sanctions. I mean, the, the, the opposition has called for, for more sanctions, but we have had sanctions for many years uh, from the EU vis-à-vis uh, -vis Belarus, and not much have been achieved. Uh, do we do we believe that sanction sanction is the best way forward here, or is it possible uh, for the EU to play a role uh, more as a, as a mediator, or is that too naive? Okay, probably I should start. 
I think that actually sanction policy, yeah, it shouldn't be. It should be just a part of the Western approach towards uh, Belarus, and uh, of course, their effect, well, let's say, frankly, is pretty modest, and it will not change much inside the country. But I think that's still important because, well, it's one of the negotiation leverage that the West has. Um, it's still important for Lukashenko that he is able to sell oil products to the West. And actually, the West is still buying it a lot and without you know, any problems with human rights abuses in Belarus. It's all this happening again. And well, we can, as we are having this event at the Norwegian Institute of International Press, we can also mention Yara, which is a great example of still doing business without any problems, while actually there are many people who are fired in Belarus for the, in Belarus Kali. I'm actually from Saligorsk, so where is Belarus Kali space? So I know a lot about this uh, enterprise and people who are there. So we still see that actually everything is going on. And, uh, and I think that what is important that Lukashenko thinks that the world will do nothing. And that makes, you know, very clear for Lukashenko that, well, let's continue your repressions. If the West is doing nothing, well, why should we stop? And that's, I think that's the main reason why I think that actually sanctions are pretty important. But do we have more in our toolbox than sanctions? Sophie, first and then Maria. Please unmute yourself. <laughs> um. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, I was uh, des desperately trying to unmute myself. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to the sanction. I'm, I'm not ready to say what other things there is in the toolbox, but I, I think maybe we should think of what do we want the sanctions to, to achieve. So you say if sa sanctions are that they were unsuccessful before or they didn't lead to much. But when I was there interviewing people kind of before all this happened, they actually thought that the sanctions were effective in that there was less direct repression against the opposition. They released the political prisoners and so on and so forth. And also when I talked to the Azerbaijani opposition, they said, oh, we want to have it like Belarus. We want to have sanctions so that they would kind of release our political prisoners. So one can think that maybe some more sanctions could achieve these more short term things actually so that it might help stop the immediate repression and, and let some people out of prison, but it might not actually lead to uh, sanctions might probably not be the thing that makes Lukashenko, Lukashenko resign in the end. Mm -hmm. And Maria? Um, I just want to add probably about sanctions and I think that sanctions are important in drawing a certain kind of symbolic line as well and supporting certain rights and freedoms. So and if Europe is uh, you know, uh, and we and we can see that this kind of line is no longer is very blurry as well because of what is happening in the member states the, and kind of also causing significant delays. And I think as well, it's not no, not only important for Belarus to have those sanctions. It's important for Europe and the European Union itself to reaffirm certain commitments to certain rights and freedoms. And it's kind of also can help to signal inside you know, uh, member states that are crossing certain lines in terms of uh, freedom for, of expressions, uh, freedom of opposition and so on, uh, will not be tolerated. So I think it also helps for them, for them to reaffirm certain boundaries of what, what is uh, possible in, the, in politics. Uh, so and this is kind of an additional level to, to this kind of puzzle, but of course, but because I also think that there is, of course, limited role in changing the domestic situation mm -hmm. uh, uh, in this regard. But I think what happened as well uh, with the European Union is the entire failure on the eastern direction. It's not just Belarus, it's also their relations with Russia. And I think until this kind of resolved, uh, it's no longer possible to have a very proactive policy toward Belarus if they don't have a proactive policy toward Russia. And this is kind of important uh, kind of part of the puzzle in, in this regard. So it's locked into the uh, EU Russia uh, dimension here. Uh, and, and, you, and you don't think that, that there is um, a leverage here beyond the, the more yeah, beyond beyond the, the, the sanctions at this stage. I mean, I, I think that the problem here with sanctions, it's uh, 
when I, I'm, I'm always kind of very reluctant to go into sanctions because it's like such a controversial topic among uh, analysts. Uh, but I think uh, for me, sanctions were important, are important when they are uh, coming in, in specific timeline. They have to come uh, in reaction and very quickly, and they have mm -hmm. to based on our on a very grounded and very kind of a good analysis of what kind of domestic actors can be targeted. So it's not just, you know, targeting the regime and elites because it has no kind of significant relevance, but it also targeting, for example, industries and uh, targeting specific, you know, uh, elements of that help to maintain the regime. And this uh, really didn't happen. So they always kind of follow the same trajectory and this, traje and this trajectory is not changing, even though it's already, you know, not the first time, not the first rodeo for the European Union to deal with Belarus. And yet I think this kind of expertise level is still absent in, in this regard to have a very proactive policy in this regard. Uh, and this is why I think it's very, yeah, it's co-dependent on as well on the Russian dimension. Mm -hmm. Nadia, you wanted to come in as well. Yes, I agree with Maria about the symbolic value. Um, I personally think that uh, sanctions are a double-edged sword, but our soil survey revealed that it's very important for the, the population because over 50% stated that the measures were considered important to them. And uh, from some qualitative data, I know even that uh, especially uh, uh, activists wish for more uh, severe sanctions and are even ready to sacrifice in order for those sanctions to be introduced. And just uh, 20 something percent considered them unimportant and that were mostly like, let's say, those from the category of regime loyalists. Um, I would just argue that the problem with sanctions is that um, they always imply counter sanctions. And the counter sanctions decided by uh, the authorities, the Belarusian authorities, are probably not affecting anyone in the EU severely, but they could affect the, the, the Belarusian population. And they will also have an effect on Russia as a, as a trading partner, which in turn could again have repercussions um, because of Russia feeling offended that this would also affect negatively then uh, the Belarusian population. Very good. Uh, if we then turn inside uh, Belarus again um, and the future of the Lukashenko regime, is is there a way for the Lukashenko regime to to turn uh, the clock back and return to the social contract, the situation pre-August 2020? And if not, uh, what would be the options that the Lukashenko regime has in its toolbox? That goes, this goes to everyone. Maria? I can start. So I think that political science is always like, you have to be wary of what you, you know predict and forecast because it will come back and haunt, and haunt you. Uh, so I, I'm not saying that there is any possible to predict uh, what will happen right now, but what I'm kind of observing and the, the tendencies that we as well observed uh, prior to the election, it's as well as the restructuring of the entire cabinet. So it's also who gained as well power. So we always kind of look into, you know, very big perspective. But I think what Nadia's research, for example, showed as well is their, uh, how their entire, you know, governing elite as well has changed. Ruling elite, I'm sorry. Ruling elite inside the Belarus has changed. It's also was a kind of uh, uh, Arton Schreiben as well uh, in his piece on, in Chatham House uh, for uh, Moscow uh, has underlined. It's this kind of securitization of uh, the ruling elite. So people from uh, security apparatus, they gained uh, more access and more voting power. I would say not kind of voting power, but basically uh, power in, uh, in in this situation. So are, this decision are very much guided to towards serving this specific group. And I think uh, um, kind of the strategies that they are offering for maintaining the regime is just, you know, 
they will not resonate in, any longer with society because these are not, you know, soft approaches that we might have observed in other types of authoritarianism. This is really hardcore securitization and repression. Uh, and I think we could even see more, uh, you know, uh, further restrictions on the media, further restriction. And we already saw that with a, with a package on, on uh, extremist legislation, the legislation on um, on uh, media, so independent outlet now are very insecure because uh, two warnings could lead to completely uh, shutting down uh, their platforms. Um, but also, like you know, or is this kind of the entire narrative of who is extremist here is also very kind of. Uh, similar to what we will probably see now more in Russia. So if uh, we have seen more in, more in the audience of Russia. So what is happening as well was uh, um, was defining who is extremist. Basically, extremist is anyone who is showing political dissent. This is also a very dangerous zone. So basically, uh, it also could you know, change the entire landscape of how people engage and political engage. So the only then form of political protest will be complete disengagement, like complete uh, 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 withdrawal from uh, from politics, even though there is still demand and political demand for change. But the only safe way to actually to live in the society will be the withdrawal from politics. And this is very dangerous um, uh, tendency. Yeah, and, and Nadia, you have also been working on securitization of, of state power in in Belarus. Could you could you also follow up on, on what Maria said here uh, about securitization? Yeah, since Maria already mentioned it, yeah, I would also argue that um, there is no return to this uh, social contract model. And, uh, and it's also not the strategy of Lukashenko or the regime, because they have, what I argue, turned the page and uh, went over to a sort of security con contract. Um, they are now not selling welfare anymore, but they're selling security. And that is comes apparent uh, or is conveyed in all those official discourses by not only the president, the current president, but also the uh, or the acting president, let's put it that way, uh, or uh, his inner circle. Um, it's they, they, they it's a form of securitization of public discourse uh, that shows that uh, the, the main um, uh, emphasis is put on security from foreign interference um, or security and protection from foreign interference and uh, also the notion of independence uh, from uh, uh, external um, actors is very, very dominant. Um, so there's really a shift uh, of the pillars. So while uh, in the past legitimacy was still very important, now repression is the, the most important pillar the regime is mm -hmm. relying on. And um, we see that um, there's literally a security contract uh, being concluded with Siloviki. Bipol has uh, Bipol, um, for all who doesn't don't know, is an initiative uh, by former uh, law enforcement officials that defected from uh, from or quitted their services, and they uh, revealed that now um, Lukashenko himself he uh, he um, gave orders that they have to be advised uh, that uh, the, to the security personnel that. In case they are not uh, following the state ideology anymore, they they should themselves resign, uh, remove their insignia, their ranks, and uh, just recently, I think uh, a few days ago, he uh, suspended uh, uh, 80 uh, Siloviki, uh, uh, removed uh, their ranks, and uh, officially declared them as outlaws or something like that. So there is literally an indoctrination and a, a security contract being concluded with the city. So it's not even stability, it's security and security from interference. That is the message now. Yeah, I would say that uh, this is the change that has taken place. Uh, of course, stability is also still important, but uh, the, the, the emphasis is put on, on security. Would could anyone uh, fill us in on uh, speaking of security and, and interference on this <clears throat> uh, uh, coup that was mentioned here uh, or plans uh, about a coup that was mentioned uh, previously? Uh, what role does that play in 
in this securitization um, uh, discourse? And what, what do we know about it? No one? Okay, I yeah, can please start, are, please. Okay, okay. Uh, well, it seems pretty obvious that it was played by Lukashenko, but at the same time, these people didn't know about that, about that, and they really believe that they are planning something. And of course, we shouldn't we shouldn't think that these people were influential and they were really capable of doing something like that. But at the same time, well, let's say frankly, many people inside the country think that peaceful protests do not work. And uh, unfortunately, many people like this sitting in their kitchens and thinking about other plans. This is why it's pretty easy to find people who can be uh, who can become like who can be involved in such plans and and to and be played like like that happened with Fiduta in courage and the rest of the people who were arrested. And, uh, and of course, security agencies are very happy about that because they are they're showing that they are important. They are showing that they are essential part of the system. That they should make any decisions because, well, when like someone is like to kill Lukashenko, so definitely Lukashenko need more security for himself, more security agencies, and the rest. So that's why I think that's very important for both the security agencies and, to Luka and Lukashenko to cooperate. At the same time, I'm not sure that uh, that actually the role of the security agencies is very, very high as happening right now. It's definitely it's huge, but at the same time, we shouldn't overestimate it because many people who were uh, the person who was running the KGB, he's now his advisor to Lukashenko with just like two, three persons of his own staff. So he was lower different uh, significantly. Person who was running the Security Council back in August, he is currently the ambassador to Azerbaijan. The person who was like responsible for these tortures, um, uh, who was minister for the interior, he's currently is advisor to Lukashenko in uh, Grodno region. So if we speak about specifically about people, actually we cannot say that their role has increased. In more, it's just like a general feeling that actually Siloviki security agencies, law enforcement agencies are very important right now. And uh, so I think that we shouldn't, I think what is important is that actually we should understand that it's like Probably this union will continue for some time, but I'm not sure that this is that this union between Lukashenko and the security agencies, that it's not a union between people. It's a union between Lukashenko and these agencies. Uh, influence of the specific people will not probably increase and they will live in some kind of competition. These security agencies showing to Lukashenko why they are the most affected. That they should they show will show that well we found a new coup against you so that's why we are important for you give us more budget money or let's say Ministry of Interior will say well I organized you several torture camps inside the country I'm super effective in that you should give me more money so that's why it's they they, they will be like competing among themselves by showing that Lukashenko that they're important but at the same time on the personal level. I do not think that actually they will achieve more than they have right now. Right. We should also, I think, uh, for, uh, touch upon the plans for a constitutional reform. That was announced some time ago, even before the, the elections. Uh, and then there is a process going on. Um, and I'm not sure what what the outcome would be, uh, what, what what the actual text would be. But as far as I understand, uh, there are plans for presenting uh, a new constitution for a referendum towards the end of the year or early next year. 
Um, what do you think this constitutional reform would entail? Would it be more of the same as we saw in Russia with the constitutional uh, reform that just, I mean, it, it, it's announced like a reform, but is it more of petrifying the, the existing order or or what, what, what is the purpose of, of this uh, constitutional uh, reform process? I probably could start. Please do, Maria. Since it's uh, often my topic <laughs> that I end up writing about, uh, about uh, and uh, well, we started uh, with Fabian Bocard to, to look into uh, the constitutional reform basically back from 2014. We wanted to understand why is it, uh, you know, they constantly bring it up uh, and we saw that there is a definitely a tendency. So they were looking into different scenarios and as well looking at their regional or uh, regional scenarios of how to conduct constitutional changes and often those are uh, those promises of a, of a constitutional reform often withdrew when there is was a, a kind of they saw that the plans didn't work out in other cases um, uh, so yeah so there was a definitely like kind of uh, plans for constitutional reform for a really lo a long time but at the same time we have seen there is no institutional commitment and no plans that were kind of in, in, that were finalized in any kind of form. So it was never, uh, it was never a proper forum, basically. So uh, they also kind of, uh, uh, they called it, there was a, uh, a council of wise men, for example, mentioned, but uh, you know, you never find any, any kind of council of wise men uh, with names uh, on, on them. Uh, but uh, it has changed, of course, was, uh, was tw in 2020 when there was a significant demand for political change and constitution was prom and a constitutional reform was promised as a response to this uh, demand for political changes. But uh, but we again saw that there is no kind of uh, significant commitment to 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 stick to those kind of reform. Yes, there is a constitutional uh, council established is a kind of discuss uh, certain issues, but as well, like it's completely controlled by the narrative of the government. And we could see as well that it has changed from uh, from being a constitutional reform, but kind of now reaffirming the existing pillars of uh, and divisions. So there is really, I don't know, I'm very pessimistic, uh, kind of, I'm very pessimistic in a way that it will actually happen. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that there is just really no scenario for them to, to kind of bring it up and to put it on a national vote at this moment. In addition to it, I don't think that they have a clear strategy and, and a kind of a vision of how it has to be, uh, how it has to be set up. Um, so I would say that they might uh, use as kind of a postponement, postponing it to the later stages when they feel much more secure. So at this moment, I can see that it's just a, uh, like because it was first announced that they will announce plans at the, at the annual address uh, to their assembly. Uh, then it again was postponed. Now it's again postponed to August 2021. Then they also announced that there will be p potentially planned in December. So this is like really the same kind of repeats the same cycle of what we have observed before. So, so more of a distraction than an actual. Yeah, uh, and I think it kind of. I'm sorry, uh, and I also think that it kind of fits the narrative as well, how they change the agenda, because uh, this uh, a plot about a coup as well kind of comes in this kind of cycle when they really wanted to shift the narrative. And here we need to shift the narrative about the assassination of the president. And then there was such you know, a significant uh, kind of narrative of how they changed it to like, now we need to have a decree of how it will happen if the president is assassinated and this kind of logic that uh, he's uh, uh, now the decree is issued at the same time it's uh, it doesn't contradict the constitutional kind of uh, lo logic so it still uh, will be the main kind of powers go with the prime minister but at the same time it just allows you know this kind of uh, uh, it, for example, foresees a, a voting logic in the Security Council and so on. So, but I, I mean, I, th I think it's just, you know, grabbing 
uh, the narrative, like just taking advantage and just uh, putting him back himself on the agenda rather than, for example, the opposition leading uh, the conversation about valor. So I think it's kind of this logic uh, in, in this regard. Oh, yeah. Yes, I would say a second uh, Maria's assessment here, and I would also say uh, say that the constitutional reform it uh, it changed its purpose over time several yeah several times, and now with this alleged coup, um, as uh, Richter already stated, uh, uh, this the, the situation also has changed again because this the notorious uh, presidential decree that is now looming there. It, it makes the constitutional reform taking a back seat because uh, you can really sense that they're the, the Lukashenko himself and 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 in his inner circle they are really in fear of the the, the, the regime's survival. Um, I, I read a statement by Prime Minister Haloshenko uh, uh, recently and he stated that they have to get ready for the physical elimination of the country's leadership. So what they're preparing for is really for a new form of governance in the state of emergency. And then uh, the Security Council is taking an, a new role instead of the uh, All Belarusian National Assembly. Um, and uh, this whole, the Security Council is, is in that case, in that scenario, it's supposed to 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 uh, take over uh, power as a collective entity. And in my opinion, that kind of shows to us, after all, that uh, the Siloviki, the security uh, officials, uh, taken a more important and more influential role there. We are unfortunately soon running out of time, uh, but uh, I'd like to let all of you have a final one minute intervention on, on, on what's next in, in Belarus. Where, where do you see uh, the development go over the next few months? Maria went against predictions here, uh, looking into the crystal ball too much, but but uh, if we could go in the order that you, you presented, uh, starting with Sophie, what what to watch out for, uh, where from now? And unmute, please. It works better with sound. No. There. There it is. It's a, yeah, it's a really serious delay you have the muting, so <laughs> I do it back and forth. Anyway, so yeah, I, I don't want to I feel that in the next few months, I'm not sure that anything is going to really change that is kind of worth talking about. <laughs> I like to take a slightly longer perspective and and I want to try to end on a bit of an, I don't know, semi optimistic note. Because I think uh, the fact that this election became such a, you know, that it was so different was that the fact that people actually engaged in the election, they actually voted. So I think any future such event when they if they would try to have some sort of referendum on the constitution or if or when Lukashenko he I mean he will have to hold some sort of elections eventually I think that I mean it cannot be expected that it will be met with the same kind of that people will ignore it like they previously did but people are I mean okay they're afraid they're not on the street anymore but I would like to think that something has changed, that people are actually more politically you know, minded, they're being politicized. So ho hopefully that will at least make it more difficult for Lukashenko to kind of keep on delaying and postponing something from changing. Good. Well, yeah. Yes, I also believe it's very difficult to take a look into the glass bowl. I, I believe we will uh, observe for some time to go the stalemate situation status quo that uh, un, that it's quite unsure how, how things will evolve. Um, I could also imagine that um, we some steps taken by Russia um, or even um, the upcoming uh, local elections could trigger new developments, but it's all difficult to say. But I would uh, um, agree with Sophie that uh, whatever happens, uh, those uh, the events of those uh, the last uh, uh, six to nine months, they really uh, changed uh, the society profoundly. And I believe this transformation process has not only been uh, sense in society but also in 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 the, the state's uh, administration i mean I, 
there can be no way that these people have been untouched by these uh, developments. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I believe that um, even even the inner circle, even even the Siloviki structure, they are not a monolithic uh, block. And if there are also forces in there that uh, see things differently, that are more prone towards the reform. And it's it's a matter of time and see to see uh, which forces will actually trigger there. Mm -hmm. And we move on to Maria. Um. Yeah, I want to actually uh, to go back to identity and I was, I was thinking what I didn't add as well uh, is the importance of uh, diaspora and how important it was in changing the logic of uh, how we engage with Belarus. Uh, this is why we now have uh, centers in exile and Vilnius and Warsaw, but you know, many more managed to unite and to uh, to make the topic of Belarus relevant and to, to, to show the urgency uh, of engaging with Belarus in a much more meaningful way. Uh, so that's, our, and, and I think this is definitely what we will see more of, like this uh, demand as well from, uh, from diaspora in different countries uh, and the pressure on, uh, on local governments to, to engage with, uh, with Belarus and to invest as well in people who were forced to migrate uh, or to relocate uh, as well. Uh, as well, I think there will be, we, we might also see uh, funding of uh, new media agencies as well abroad. We saw, for example, in Germany that they invested uh, in creating a Deutsche Welle Belarus. Uh, so now there is a YouTube channel where uh, it's still like in, in, in Russian, but at the same time, it's, it's important to have that channel independent of, you know, Russia's, Russia's Russian service, because most of the time Belarus were part of the Russia coverage. Um, uh, and I think it's in, in general, I, I kind of believe uh, I always end on a positive note, even in, in, in my pieces, I think I believe in a generational change uh, uh, of people who are very educated. Uh, they are uh, looking in a different kind of uh, dimension of civic and political rights. They want to advocate for having those rights in the state where it matters and they're uh, and this is what we see is the old generation. And as much as they want to, you know, hold on to power, the life is, you know, as long. So they also will have to pass. So that's why I'm kind of in a kind of in a positive way thinking that the change will come. Good. And finally, Rikoy, some final comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, in the short term, I'm very pessimistic. I think that We'll see continuation of repressions, of tortures, of rights of political prisoners. I think that Russia will increase its leverage inside the country. The West will be less interested in Belarus, so many people will leave the country, etc. So I'm super optimistic. I, I don't expect anything good to happen the next months and probably next year. So uh, in the if you speak about maybe in the long term, I think that this regime is, is unsustainable because it's very difficult to exist when you have when majority of the society rejects you. So I think that probably that will finally lead to some meaningful change in, in the country. And uh, what I see also that actually many people inside the establishment, they are very lazy in doing their work right now because they also see that what the whole point of doing anything because Lukashenko is leading us to nowhere and uh, they are really dissatisfied with their role and uh, within the system that actually they became part of this all, all these crimes and uh, and uh, I think that that's why they actually what they're doing right now that they they're not bringing any new ideas to him and they are not trying to change the economy they're not trying to improve anything inside the country so basically what we are seeing that you know it's like they just they just wait for something uh, probably they're I think that what is realistic for them, what they think that they think, probably they even hope about the physical deaths, unfortunately. And what's like, um, there's the realistic assessment of the situation, unfortunately. So I think that anyway, in the long term, everything will be all right. Let's, let's have some optimism here in the end. Okay, but uh, unfortunately, in the next several months, it will be a disaster. Then uh, it's just for me uh, on this semi-optimistic note to, to thank the panelists for 
enlightening us uh, about uh, what's going on in Belarus and uh, and a special thanks to to Maria uh, for for bringing us together and, and taking this uh, initiative. Um, uh, thank you also to the audience for for uh, for uh, attending today. And uh, what's left for me to say then is uh, just a reminder that you will find this and other public uh, uh, events, recordings of public events and seminars at, uh, at NUPI at our YouTube channel. So look, please look us up uh, there and please uh, tune in again for new seminars in the near future. Thank you very much.